Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to October's virtual speaker presentation called Phyllis Turner Ross, Career Woman and Single Mother, featuring guest speaker Paul Litt. Paul's presentation will be followed by a pre recorded interview by Phyllis's daughter and sister of Canada's former Prime Minister, John Napier Turner, Brenda Norris. My name is Sarazad Khan, and I, alongside Ben Weiss and Jacob Saloom, will be your hosts tonight. Before we begin, let us take a moment take a to moment. acknowledge the people whose land we meet on tonight. For thousands of years before colonial times, the members of indigenous communities traveled from far and wide to gather at the meeting place of the three rivers, the Ottawa, the Gatineau, and the Rideau, from the Saudier Falls to the mouth of the Gatineau River. This area is rich in natural resources, plants, animals, and fish, and also provided a convenient meeting place for trade and communication among communities. Of special significance are the burial places at Hull Landing and the Sodier Falls, a sacred place of meeting and sharing in ceremonies. Sharing in ceremonies. The burial grounds in the Ottawa Gatineau Corridor, along, uh, including Hull Landing, were important for rituals of respect and bonding with the landscape. Victoria Island, located under the Portage Bridge, continues to provide the sacred space of local to local and visiting indigenous people. The national capital region, which includes the city of Ottawa, remains unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. We encourage our members and guests to reflect on this, our connected history, and ways we can contribute to reconciliation. Next, we would like to extend our thanks to the city of Ottawa, the province of Ontario, and last but never least, to our membership. Without your support, none of, none of what the Historical Society of Ottawa does would be possible. I also want to note that 2023 is a significant year for the HSO as it marks the 125th anniversary of our founding in 1898. We've been telling Ottawa's great stories throughout those 125 years, including now through our twice monthly speaker series. Ben Weiss has coordinated our speaker series for the past four years, and he also runs the HSO's Facebook page. He will also help facilitate the Q&A later tonight. Before we turn to Ben, a quick reminder to everyone to kindly keep your settings on mute so as not to interfere with our speaker's presentation and to turn off your video feed once we get going. It, it assists with, our, with the overall transmission. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a Q&A. So during the presentation, please start typing your great questions into the chat box. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Shahrazad. The late Francois Brigay and I shared a passion for the rich history of Ottawa's Sandy Hill neighborhood, a neighborhood central not only to the history of the nation's capital, but also in many ways pivotal to the history of our nation. Francois and I also both recognize the richness of women's history in Ottawa. The stories of, of Elizabeth Briere and the Grey Nuns, the Battle of the Hatpins, the May Court Club, Maude Lampman, the Examination Unit, Lillian Freeman, Charlotte Witten, and Marion Dewar are just some of those we've shared in our speaker series these past few years. If you visit the late Francois Brega's wonderful website on Sand Hill history, you will see that Francois tells stories of some of those same amazing women and others, Lillian Freeman, Amanda Walker Marchand, Barbara Ann Scott, Marie Rose Turcot, and many more. It was also while perusing Francois's fascinating website on Sandy Hill history several years ago that I first became aware of Phyllis Turner. I knew right away that this was a story that needed to be told, but I was surprised to find how little information there was out there about her. It was finally when I thought to track down Paul Litt's 2011 biography of John Turner that I discovered that Paul had written extensively about Phyllis Turner and those early years in Sandy Hill in the book's early chapters. The whole book is a fascinating read, by the way, about a states statesman whose brief tenure as prime minister is really just a footnote during an extensive career during which he made significant impact on our nation. But going back to those first chapters, I quickly approached Paul about adapting them into an HSO pamphlet to finally be able to make people aware 
of the remarkable story of Phyllis Turner. Paul kindly and enthusiastically consented to do so. And that's when things took a bit of a twist. Our fantastic pamphlet editor, Christine Jackson, a skilled genealogist, got curious about the Turner family background and what circumstances led to a single mother showing up in Ottawa in the 1930s trying to feed her children. Those who have read the pamphlet on our website are familiar with Christine's research findings. The deeper that Christine dug, the more it all just increased our admiration for Phyllis Turner and the challenges she had to overcome, especially in that era. In Steve Pakin's more recent biography of John Turner, Pakin simply refers to the Turner family history as murky. It was Christine's suggestion, in fact, that tonight we just leave it at that and not distract from the primary story we want to share tonight, the story of a remarkable woman who clearly left her mark on her son, John, a future prime minister, and her daughter, Brenda, daughter Brenda, a remarkable woman in her own right, who we will be privileged to hear from personally after Paul's presentation. We are so pleased that Paul consented to share his Phyllis Turner story also as part of our speaker series and is here tonight to do so. Dr. Paul Litt is a professor of public history at Carleton with a cross appointment to the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies. As historian, Paul's focus has been on 20th century, late 20th century Canada with special interests in culture, naturalism, and nationalism, and the politics of image and public history. If you check out Paul's biography and see the great stuff Paul has taught and written about, you'll definitely say to yourself, hey, this is a fascinating guy. I want to sit down and have a beer or coffee with. And the great news is tonight we do have a chance to sit back and listen to Dr. Litt. As uh, Saharazad said, a reminder to everyone to please stay on mute uh, so as not to interfere with our speaker's presentation. And sometimes it helps our transmission if you turn off your video as well. And remember to type in your great questions into the Zoom chat box, and Paul will try to answer as many as possible at the conclusion of tonight's presentation. And over to you, Paul. Well, thanks, Ben. Um, I don't have a beer or a coffee, but I do have a very large glass of water, which I'm enjoying. I'd like to um, thank Ben for making all this happen, as well as everybody else at the Historical Society of Ottawa who uh, has worked on this. It's great to have this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to comment on certain aspects of Phyllis's life rather than narrate all the details. If you have not yet read the pamphlet, I urge you to read it as Ben just did. Um, you could get, you can go to it for more background on tonight's session. My themes are going to be the notable accomplishment notable accomplishments, I should say, uh, Phyllis Turner or Phyllis Ross or Phyllis Gregory, as she was variously known, of her life, um, rather than trying to narrate all the details um, and the challenges that she faced as a woman in a man's world, as well as what her career tells us about our society in the past, understanding that the past always reverberates in the present. This is the house in Rossland, a small town in the southern interior of British Columbia that Phyllis Gregory grew up in with three siblings. I pulled the color photo from Google Maps, so apparently the house is still standing. The black and white photo is of uh, Phyllis Ross, Phyllis Gregory as a child, visiting it back in the 1950s. Her parents were transplanted maritimers. Her father was the hoist engineer in the local gold mine. So not a deprived childhood, but not one deemed terribly likely to produce an accomplished scholar. Yet at the tender age of 17, off she went to UBC. UBC then was not the UBC we know now on Point Grey. It was this uh, collection of old buildings in downtown Vancouver. It had about a thousand students and uh, yeah, it was, but they had purchased the land and were going to move on, but it was quite a small and new institution at the time. She won um, scholarships. She studied economics and political science, graduated with honors in both, a double major in 1925. 
And then she got scholarships to go on um, to graduate school at Bryn Mawr University near Philadelphia. So this was a huge leap from UBC to an elite American institution. She excelled there as well, earning an MA in economics in 1927 and then starting a doctoral program, again, funded by scholarships. This put her in rarefied company. I can't find any statistics for how many women in Canada had doctorates at the time or were even in doctoral programs, but there weren't a lot. Um, when she was at UBC, there's a substantial minority of students who were women, about a third of the students were women. That was a lot for the time. Um, but the percentage diminished quite startlingly when you got to graduate school. So how'd she do it? Obviously she was smart and she worked hard. Nevertheless, it's hard to do well at university if you don't come preloaded with skills and knowledge. So where did that come from? According to Phyllis's daughter, Brenda, it was her mother who came from a more prosperous background than her father, who created the conditions at home that gave her a head start in life academically. The next leap was across the pond to elite universities in Europe. She studied at the London School of Economics for a year and then went to the University of Marburg to pursue research for her doctorate. At some point in this period, she met Leonard Turner. They settled down and started a family. And that period in her life is hard to reconstruct. I was intrigued that Christine Jackson's research on Leonard Turner revealed that his father was institutionalized for mental illness. We already knew that Leonard died of a thyroidectomy. This is his death certificate. Complications associated with the surgery did him in at the age of 28. I've been particularly interested in this because my grandfather, if you excuse me getting personal for a moment, I say my grandfather, I meant my grandmother. My grandmother had a thyroidectomy in the 1920s as well and was an invalid for the rest of her life. And she was also treated by the medical profession for mental illness, which is understandable because thyroid problems can be mistaken as mental illness. They can cause anxiety, unpredictable mood swings and depression. So pure speculation, but this leads me to wonder whether there was an inherited condition in the Turner family that affected both father and son. Diagnosed as mental illness in the father's case and as an overactive thyroid in Leonard's. We'll probably never know. This is just one of the many mysteries immersed in the murky London fog that surrounds Phyllis's London years. So Phyllis found herself alone, the single mother of two children, far from home, in the middle of the Depression. This was a far cry from her run as a brilliant student in the 1920s, the big crisis of her life, I think. Her two beautiful children, pictured here in Rossland with her, were no doubt a great consolation, but as a single mother in a man's world, her prospects were not encouraging. She regrouped as this photo suggests by returning home, crossing the Atlantic by ship and then Canada by train with her children. And then she began a job hunt. Imagine the strength of character all of this took, not to mention the uncertainty and the stress. I should think it would sear the experience and memory. In determining what to do next, Phyllis was up against a sexist society. Single mothers didn't fit in because social mores privileged the two-parent family. Middle-class respectability was still influenced by binary Victorian notions of femininity and masculinity that equated them with the separate spheres of private and public life. Women were deemed designed by nature to be nurturers with domestic instincts and refined moral sensibilities. 
The separate spheres were being challenged by feminists who were pursuing equal rights for women. Women had only recently gotten the vote and gotten elected to parliament. In this regard, it's interesting that social movements, in order to get their goals, to achieve their goals, have to leverage mainstream beliefs in order to get general acceptance for what they're after. Consequently, contemporary feminists often worked with rather than against gender biases. They deployed maternal feminist arguments, claiming that women's moral influence was required in the public sphere to clean up politics and to protect the home and family from the dangers of modern mass industrial society. Correspondingly, women's beachheads in the workforce were healthcare, social work, and education, reflecting their supposed nurturing character. Phyllis, in this regard, too, was an exception as an economist. It made sense for the women's movement to work with rather than against popular prejudices because they were so deeply embedded. Respectable middle-class mores were intended to protect women, nurture children, and control procreation to ensure, among other things, intergener intergenerational transfer of family status. Yet this came at a steep cost of denying the majority of the population equal political and legal rights. And as this McLean's cover suggests, the cult of motherhood also involved a lot of household drudgery. Church going, of course, was a mark of respectability in an era in which Christianity and civility were consonant and established churches preached and policed traditional gender norms and family values. But attempting to channel and control human nature required massive doses of hypocrisy. The birds and the bees euphemism exemplifies how polite society sublimated base appetites. It tried to maintain the collective delusion that sex was a private matter confined to married heterosexual couples for the purpose of raising a family. The yawning gap between this theoretical ideal and the actual practice bred furtiveness and anxiety, not to mention vast ignorance, consequent suffering and guilt. Here's the Turner home in Eastern Sandy Hill. Still there again, according to Google Maps. As good Catholics, the Turners attended St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Sandy Hill. I should note that despite what I've said just recently, respectable morality was not uncontested. First of all, in practice, it was a gendered ideal. Women were expected to be the moral bedrock of civility and those who failed to conform could be socially ostracized. But there was a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, double standard for men. Let, let's keep in mind as well that the 1920s had been the jazz age in which privileged youth experimented with alternative models of femininity. In popular culture, the flapper became the prototypical new woman. New women jettisoned frilly billowing dresses and confining undergarments, bobbed their hair, smoked cigarettes and drank in public in threateningly hedonistic ways. Freudian theories about sex became titillating cocktail chatter for the smart set. I'm going on about all of this just to give you an idea of the social currents that Phyllis Turner was navigating at the time. She was no flapper, but she was willy nilly a career woman. Ironically, here her single mother status was an asset. Women who worked for the federal government had to quit when they got married but she was post-marriage as a widow and thus as head of the household, she was deemed entitled to earn a living. And her timing wasn't bad either. It was a critical moment in state formation in Canada. She joined a public service that was being transformed from a backwater of patronage and archaic ad hoc procedures to a more professional, rationalized, meritocratic bureaucracy.
This was the era in which external affairs professionalized and hired bright prospects who Jack Granitstein dubbed the Ottawa men. Granitstein, perhaps a bit nostalgically, described them as luminaries of a golden age of the Canadian public service, a time when it was a model of policy, innovation, and efficiency that rivaled the very best in the Western world. Ottawa was a much smaller place back then, particularly amongst the university educated. Phyllis knew Norman Robertson, then an up-and-comer in external affairs from UBC. And she quickly got to know others, including Hugh Keenleyside, another diplomat. She became friends with Graham Towers, governor of the Bank of Canada. She rented a cottage in the Gatineau that was next door to the Pearson's cottage. Eventually, her friends included Donald Gordon, who was then at the Bank of Canada as well. All of them were in on the ground floor of departments that would grow quickly, pushing them to the top. The tariff board, for example, where Phyllis first found work was a brand new agency. The Bank of Canada was established in 1935, the year after she got to Ottawa. Meanwhile, external affairs was expanding its responsibilities and building up the diplomatic corps required for an increasingly independent Canada to exercise its own foreign policy. By 1939, Turner had worked her way up to the position of chief research economist for the tariff board. She might have been considered one of the Ottawa men had she not been a woman. Like them, she was an intelligent, well-educated, adaptable generalist with Anglo-Canadian origins, cosmopolitan experience, and an internationalist perspective. Her Catholicism was unusual for this group, most of whom are Protestants, including many sons of the manse. Another difference was that she came from working class origins with the proviso that her family's privileging of education was a notable characteristic of the middle class and her father as a skilled tradesman could be considered you know, middle class as well, perhaps. So the Ottawa Mandarins could have made more money in other lines of work. But on the other hand, they were yielding power in a state that was growing in size and influence as it abandoned laissez-faire and intervened in new sectors to alleviate the depression and then geared up to fight a total war against Nazism. As war threatened in September of 1939, Turner was seconded to the Wartime Prices and Trade Board. It was established at the start of the war to prevent a reoccurrence of the inflation and war profiteering scandals of the First World War. Sugar was her beat, and she was standing in a sugar beet field in Alberta when she learned that war had been declared. She was soon swept up in a sugar crisis. Remember toilet paper at the start of COVID? Consumers immediately began hoarding sugar and millions of small purchases quickly added up. At the same time, many of the ships that had been delivering sugar were ordered into nearby ports, so supply dried up. Turner was on the phone five or six hours a day trying to commandeer new sources of sugar. Once she had gotten the goods, she had to figure out how to distribute them deciding how much could go to consumers, how much could go to Canadian industry, and how much to Britain for its needs. In October 1941, the board's powers were greatly increased in an attempt to further stabilize wages and salaries. Donald Gordon was brought in as chief to spearhead a campaign to win public acceptance of controls and rationing to fight black market profiteering. Soon after, Phyllis Turner was appointed Oils and Fats Administrator, an office she would hold for the duration of the war. This made her the most senior woman in the federal civil service. Just as with sugar, it was Turner's responsibility to coordinate production and distribution of commodities that were critical to wartime production 
but scarce under wartime conditions. And it's ironic, I think, that you know, the senior woman in the public service would have the title of oils and fats administrator. It's kind of an unattractive title to have. Better than being maybe queen of Greece and lard or being the fat lady, but uh, that was what she was known as. In any case, when you find out what she was doing, you realize how critical to the war effort her job was. Oils and fats were essential to industrial production. Think, for instance, of uh, lubricants and adhesives. Uh, they were critical to the general food supply, butter, other oils and fats. For they were necessary for the maintenance of uh, factories and homes because they were key to paints and oils and polishes. Uh, they were a part of personal hygiene in soaps and shampoos. Even office supplies like ink and uh, adhesives, again, would uh, be required, or oil would be, oils and fats would be required for those. But most importantly, glycerin, a component of fat, was a key ingredient in explosives. As the war effort expanded, Turner was increasingly involved in negotiations with the British and Americans to procure and manage critical commodities and direct them where they were most needed, which meant traveling to Washington for negotiations. She imposed production controls on manufacturers, restricting, for instance, the number of different colors of paint or lipstick you could have. Her department also encouraged recycling by consumers, supervised rationing for consumers and industry, while at the same time working hard to, finding, to find substitutes for these products. Securing supply was the hardest part of her job. The German occupation of Norway had cut off 75% of the Canadian supply of fish oils. So she toured the Maritimes, persuaded fishermen to save codfish livers that they usually threw away and spurred the establishment of new plants to produce cod liver oil. Then she went to the West Coast to source dogfish livers, which yielded a substitute oil rich in vitamins that could be used to supplement diets constricted by wartime conditions. Her boss, Donald Gordon, was impressed, saying, I didn't even know that a dogfish had a liver. Factories on the East and West Coasts had produced 56,000 gallons of cod liver oil in 1939. By 1941, they were producing over 220,000 gallons, a fourfold increase. And at the end of the war, Canada had a new export industry. She did all of this despite the fact that she didn't have the power to coerce producers or money to bribe them. She had to rely on persuasion to get industries to tailor their production to the country's wartime needs. She cajoled meat packers to save and process oil byproducts and persuaded brewery owner E.P. Taylor to build a soya bean processing fa uh, facility in Toronto, Victory Mills. In 1942, this will be the last of my examples, a shortage of linseed oil was anticipated. Turner made her arrangements with farmers to plant flax seed, which in due course yielded a crop of 20 million bushels, an increase in production of about 300%. Her work gives you a glimpse of the unprecedented role of the state in directing Canada's productive capacity towards total war. It was effectively a command economy driven not by the market, but by state coordination in pursuit of one overriding collective goal. Just as an aside, oh, my slides are getting carried away from me here. There we go. It's ironic to think that her son, 30 years later, would resign as finance minister from Trudeau's liberal government 
over differences in how to implement wage and price controls. Those who worked with the Wartime Trade and Prices Board and the Wartime Information Board used public relations campaigns to get consumers on side. And in the process, they learned a lot about how to win democratic support for policy initiatives. After the war, they would apply these lessons to peacetime Canada, ushering in a new era of politics attuned to monitoring and managing public opinion. In my research, I've often bumped into them applying their formative wartime experience to managing the populace in peacetime. So, in Canada's wartime capital, 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 there were the Ottawa men, and then there was the Ottawa woman, who incidentally was paid less than men doing the same job. But since so few other women had as high profile a role in the war effort, Turner attracted media attention. Journalists had problems squaring her authority and worldly pragmatism with prevailing gender stereotypes. They went to great lengths to placate, to placate fears that a female executive was a threat to the established order. In May of 1942, when she was a guest on NBC's public affairs radio show, pictured here, America's town meeting of the air, the host declared that she was, quote, not at all a movie version of a woman economist, but a strikingly beautiful woman. Which is odd because I was trying to think of what the movie version of a woman economist was. I can't think of many women economists in any of the classic movies, but there you are. I guess they're, they're supposed to be um, unfeminine in some way. The author of the 1942 Maclean's article tied herself in knots trying to reassure readers that her subject's career success hadn't compromised her femininity. She extolled her beauty and her fashion sense and insisted that she hadn't forgotten how to house clean, cook, and sew. They were equally at pains to reassure readers that her career wasn't compromising her role as a mother. So while her gender made her newsworthy, clearly it also threatened conventional norms of femininity and motherhood. Just to give you an idea of how composed, uh, quick-witted and uh, funny Turner could be, when asked by a journalist whether her feminine presence changed the way men behaved in meetings, she said, I don't know because I've never been in a meeting that's all men. Makes sense. At the end of the war, Turner walked away from her career. In 1945, she married a millionaire and moved to British Columbia. She was only 41. Incredibly, she had been barely 30 when she first started with the tariff board and her public service career ran for a little more than a decade. The Ottawa men, in contrast, went on to bigger and better things in ensuing decades. Pearson, of course, became prime minister, retiring in 1968. Norman Robertson served in major diplomatic posts and was an Eminence Gris in foreign affairs for years to come. Donald Gordon eventually became president of the CNR and so on. So all of the Ottawa men, as they were known, continued on in politics and government and uh, had stellar careers. It makes you wonder what she could have accomplished if she'd stayed. Perhaps the answer is not too much. Maybe she felt that she had hit the glass ceiling, that she'd achieved all she could as a woman in a patriarchal public service. And maybe she was right. On the one hand, you could say that she reverted to being the wife of on the other hand, she was the wife of a rich and powerful man, a role in which she arguably wielded more influence than she could have as a public servant. 
She and her husband, Frank Ross, moved to Vancouver, where he directed his business interests and settled into this cozy little establishment in the West Point Gray neighborhood. In time, Phyllis Turner devoted her considerable talents to volunteer work. In the early 1950s, she served on the executives of the Canadian Federation of University Women and the Senate of the University of British Columbia. Then in 1955, Ross was named Lieutenant Governor of the province. As Chatelain of Government House in Victoria, Phyllis Ross became a familiar figure in British Columbian pub public life. Uh, his term wound up in 1960. She was appointed to the Board of Governors of UBC in 1957 and in 1961 was elected chancellor, the first female university chancellor in the Commonwealth. She also served on the executive of the Canadian Centenary Council as the centennial approached. And as outlined in the pamphlet, she was showered in, with honors and recognition of her contributions to Canadian public life. Here she is pictured with her, she's on the left, and then her daughter, in law Jill Turner, is next. John Turner, who you probably recognize, and Brenda Turner, far right. In the 1980s, as she suffered from Alzheimer's, she never knew that her son, John, became president, or president, became leader of the Liberal Party and prime minister in 1984. As her condition degenerated, her family moved her into a nursing home on Salt Spring Island, where she passed away in 1988. So in closing, I want to reiterate a point that Ben made originally, which is why hasn't someone written her biography? Why is so little known about her? Her career makes her a unique path-breaking figure in the history of Canadian women in the workforce. Her private life makes her a fascinating case study of the place of women in Canadian society and the challenges they faced as wives and mothers. Yet there's been remarkably little written about her, either in journalism or in scholarship since her death. I hope that the HSO's pamphlet and this evening's discussions will rekindle interest in and appreciation of Phyllis Turner. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now. I came across research that I'd done, what, in the uh, early 2000s for the biography and material that, uh, because the focus of the biography was on John Turner and his political career, uh, a lot of material on uh, on his mother just sort of fell by the wayside in the, the editing process as so often happens. And well, I was able to recover some of that to use tonight. As you when said, you start, the talking, when you start talking about the details of, you know, dogfish livers, then you know that uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're into the nitty gritty. And, and like you say, the opportunity is there to 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 have somebody, perhaps yourself, uh, dig in and 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 write the full biography on on Phyllis Gregory Turner Ross and all the contributions that she made. I was hoping some graduate student would be watching tonight and uh, find their thesis. While we're waiting for Jacob, I think I will pose a question to you, Paul. And you know you, you've got you've gotten into it in your book. I know that um, it, it's clear that 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 Phyllis Turner was such an influence on um, on both of her children um, in terms of their dedication to public service and in terms of the positive use of charm. I mean, Phyllis Turner was obviously a charming woman. John Turner was a charming man. 
and in my interactions with uh, with uh, Brenda Norris these past couple of weeks, she's a very charming woman as well. Um, and, and again, the dedication to public service, which John Turner fulfilled over half a century, as did Brenda Norris with the work she has done in Montreal, in particular with McGill University. But I guess one of the things that comes along is, you know, when you look at John Turner, you could say that he was a man for the 60s and perhaps the 70s, because when the 80s and 90s came along, he would sometimes exhi exhibit behaviors that were more reminiscent of an episode of Mad Men, where, you know, today we would refer to his behavior as representative of male chauvinism. Uh, which might have been an unfair title back in the 60s, but one wonders why he did not evolve as, as more of a feminist himself, having been brought up by this amazing woman. Have you explored that, that, that mystery? Uh, I've thought about it a bit, and you know there, there are limitations to how much you can speculate about things that you can never really know, but you know, informed speculation is always fun. So... Um, a Freudian would say, would trace it back to the lack of a father somehow, I'm sure. Um, but when I was briefly mentioning a double standard for men, I think John Turner was overly seduced by some romantic notion of male fraternity in a you know jock locker room mode, um, which... Um, someone who had a strong father role model might not have been so seduced by. And that's, you know, again, amateur psychological speculation on my part. Definitely a madman figure who failed to evolve. You remember the famous uh, bum padding incident in the 80s? Yeah. And, uh, you know, feminists would show up with bum shields at uh, Turner <laughs> rallies after that. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, he, he didn't get the memo about that. And um, it's uh, one of the most disappointing aspects of his character, actually, the degree to which um, I, you know, I, I haven't read the Pakin biography, but the um, a lot of the personal um, stuff that I came across when I was using it as a, a resource, I wanted to check what he said about uh, his childhood and about his mother. Um, it it was emblematic of uh, it seems to be emblematic of the whole uh, Mad Men uh, spirit that uh, that he embodied. So we have uh, uh, Jennifer has asked us or made a comment. She said her story would make an interesting, uh, comparable, and Canadian content to Charlotte Gray's new book, Passionate Mother, Powerful Sons: The Lives of. Uh, uh, Jenny Jerome Churchill and Sandra Del Delano Roosevelt, and it's interesting because I had uh, I had I had sent a text to to Charlotte Gray a, a couple of weeks ago, asking her if she was aware that we were doing this presentation and that we had had this pamphlet, and she commented that she very much had enjoyed the pamphlet that you and Christine had written, and she saw some of the parallels with the book that she had written about the mothers of, of Churchill and Roosevelt. Um, I have, I have another question here from from um, from Sonia, who's who's wondering when it was the public service rules would have changed to allow married women to remain employed. I'm not uh, exactly sure. Actually, I have an example from um, someone I know who was in the American public service in. I think it happened in the, in the 1970s in her case. So whether it happened earlier in Canada or not, I don't know. Um, Anne has mentioned that her grandmother married in secret in 1919 so that you would not lose her civil service job. And, and <laughs> certainly we've heard all the stories. I mean, Ottawa had nursing schools where women would train to become a nurse and they would only they would only be a nurse until they got married. And we know all the stories about the teachers in the one room schoolhouses who were fantastic teachers from the age of 16. But as soon as they got married, they were no longer teachers. So it was the norm in, in any kind of public service, let alone the federal public service. Again, a reminder to everybody that we will be playing, hopefully, a interview that Paul and I had conducted with um, 
asked Brenda Norris last week. We're just holding on that. So we're just going through a few of our questions right now. So Dorothy asks, uh, do we know if she left any letters from either of the two major parts of her life? Any correspondence, any journals, I suppose? Well, the last um, slide that I showed had a picture of the finding aid in the Vancouver archives where some of her papers reside. And from perusing the finding aid, I didn't see a lot of personal material. I saw a lot of her civil service um, economist uh, material like on sugar, on uh, oils and fats and so on, studies of various kinds. So I think that she left a lot of that material um, and not the personal stuff, but I'm not sure. I haven't been into that archive. There might be a lot there. When I was writing the biography, I had a researcher in Vancouver go in and look for, for things, but he could come back with nothing on you know, her personal life. That's uh, secondhand information, but I, I think it's probably pretty reliable. However, University of British Columbia also has a lot of material related to her as chancellor and a board member. Um, including a lot of speeches. And if you you want to go on a real Phyllis Turner Ross kick, you can uh, go to their um, audio archives where you can hear her giving speeches as chancellor. So her voice has been preserved. That's pretty remarkable as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have had quite a bit of interaction over the last few years with the Canadian uh, Federation of University Women, uh, comparing notes in terms of speaker series. I believe there's a couple of uh, organizations, a few organizations in the city, a few branches in the city. Um, Jennifer makes a note that it'd be interesting checking with the CFUW records at the Library and Archives Canada. There might be something mm -hmm. uh, there. And again, that would be, you know, that'd be interesting in terms of her work, but it wouldn't tell you a lot about her personal life. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure if any private letters or papers have remained. One of the interesting things about researching this period um, is that a lot of letters that would have existed for a 19th century object of inquiry do not exist because people use the telephone a lot more. Now, this generation, her generation, they were still letter writers, but, you know, things that would have been communicated by letter in, uh, in previous decades, well, in, in the night, going back 40 or 50 years, would now be uh, transacted by telephone. So in a sense, there's the, the change in communications technologies uh, has deprived historians of a great deal of material that might otherwise exist. I've, I've thought about that fact a lot too. There seems to be the lost decades where the letters ended and the phone calls rained. And I, and I do wonder in the era of emails and texts, whether that cyber conversation will be preserved for future historians or will, will that'll just disappear. But I guess the, the future will tell us that before we know. So one of the, one of the interesting things about interviewing um, Mrs. Norris last week was that you had interviewed her almost two decades ago. So that must have been a bit of an interesting experience going back to her, um, asking her some of the same questions that you'd had the opportunity to ask her um, again two decades ago. Yes, although I must have misheard her a couple of decades ago because in the book I said that Phyllis uh, Gregory's father was uh, the one who encouraged her to uh, get a university education. And this time, uh, Brenda Norris said that it was the mother, which I had suspected originally. I was I was surprised when I was told it was the father, but nevertheless, in the biography, it has the the father, which now apparently is a suspect assertion. The uh, so, it sounds like is is ready to play the video, Paul. Great. So we'll we'll give uh, Jacob to go ahead and do that now. My name is Ben Weiss, and on behalf of the Historical Society of Ottawa, I am 
am thrilled and honored to welcome a very special guest this evening. Aside from being the daughter of the esteemed Phyllis Turner Ross and brother to Canada's 17th Prime Minister, Mrs. Norris herself has made a huge impact on this nation over the last seven decades. It's easy to take for granted how far we've come, but Brenda Norris was a trailblazer for women in traditionally male-dominated industries, a fearless pioneer breaking glass ceilings in the worlds of finance and real estate, a pillar of the community in her adopted hometown of Montreal, renowned for her philanthropic work and her decades of giving back to McGill University, her alma mater. Brenda Norris in her lifetime has done more for generations of women and all Canadians than most will ever truly know and appreciate. This evening, I'm gonna let our guest speaker, Paul Litt, ask most of the questions. We want to learn what it has meant to you to have Paul in the Historical Society of Ottawa help spread the word about your remarkable mother's story. We would also love to hear your personal recollections of your mother and growing up with your brother, John, in those early years back here in Ottawa. But Mrs. Norris, first, I'd like to ask you this. How much was your mother an influence in making you the person you came to be? Oh, I would say my mother was my biggest influence in my life. Absolutely. Uh, she was my shining star. I, I was so proud of everything she did, but she was the most wonderful mother as well. Um, she was full of wit and full of charm. And she, uh, she, she John and I were the, 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 the biggest interest in her life, although she achieved so much in the, in the government and other the chancellor of UBC, et cetera. But she always put the children first. And uh, I don't think anyone could have had a more dedicated mother. And I adored her. I, and she was great fun. And she had many, many admirers because she was very beautiful. And she, um, I don't know, in my life, I never, I never encountered anybody that I admired so much as my mother. Paul? Well, I was very pleased when the Historical Society of Ottawa asked me to uh, reprint a chapter from the biography in one of their pamphlets because I've always thought that um, there hasn't been enough historical attention paid to your mother. And uh, it would make a great topic for a graduate student to do a thesis on. Um, anyways, maybe that will come in the future, maybe with the interest that we're stirring, if um, this pamphlet is well received, that will, uh, that will follow. But in when I was um, told about this opportunity to speak with you tonight, I was delighted with that because it's another opportunity to document um, what her life was like in, in Ottawa and afterwards, and uh, you know, just enrich the historical record that much more. So um, one way we could start is for you just to tell me what you think has been overlooked, what hasn't been you know, in print that should be, things about your mother that aren't well known. Um, I also have a series of questions, if you'd uh, rather just go through the questions and think about that big I question. Rather, I think I'd rather go through the questions. Okay, and then we'll, we'll return to that at the end and see if we can draw any conclusions. Uh, back in 2005, the last time um, I interviewed you, uh, I was interested in how, you know, a young woman from a remote British Columbian town ended up being such a star student at UBC and then onward after that. And you told me, I was rather surprised, you told me that you thought it was your maternal grandfather who was the biggest influence in promoting her um, interest in education. I would have thought it was her mother, but uh, could you? I, I, no, I don't even remember saying that because I really think her mother was the strongest, that my grandmother was stronger, bigger than my grandfather was. And okay. And uh, I think she motivated, but but uh, my mother, as you know, went to UBC and won a scholarship to Bryn Mawr and mm -hmm. a scholarship to the London School of Economics. And um, she did her thesis. Her thesis was going to be on the Duke of Boris, but she never, ever finished it. But um, when she went back to Rossland after my father died, I was only two months, <clears throat> she then wondered how she was going to how she was going to achieve what she wanted in her life. And she wrote to the tariff board in Ottawa, and Judge Sedgwick said, come to Ottawa, we will interview you, but leave the children. Well, she came to Ottawa, but she didn't leave the children. She brought us with her, and mm -hmm. she retired. And I remember it was in the Depression, and I can remember outside our back door in Sandy Hill, every night when she came home from work, there were men lining up for sleep. 
and she always gave them the soup and she always taught me into my dying day, I cannot throw out food if it hasn't come back. Because nothing, you in the depression, if you're a child of the depression, you throw nothing out. And that so, is, Oh, I'm sorry. Did oh, I interrupt you? Oh, well, you know, when you go to university, it takes more than just hard work and smarts to succeed. I think it matters. Your background matters a lot. The cultural uh, values of your family, the cultural capital they have matters a lot. And so I'm, when I'm thinking about her family in Rossland, uh, you know, you can consider them to be working class, perhaps economically, although her father was a skilled uh, skilled tradesman, right? But well, perhaps would you would you say they were in terms of their cultural values, they were more middle class, or what? How would you, how would you address that whole issue of her background? I know. I and my grandfather actually I think, was a miner. He came out in for the gold rush, and mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother played was a daughter of a very wealthy ship owner in Nova Scotia, and he was very much against her going out west, but she followed him out west when she was married. She went with him out west, and she played the local organ. My mother played the piano at one point. I was going to do her ATCM and, and be a piano teacher, if you can believe it. Anyway, my grandmother was very musical and, and very cultured, and I don't know, I suppose these things run by osmosis. You, you, right. you get these, but she went to UBC, and uh, my mother was smarter than John or me. I mean, I have to tell you, she was one of the most intelligent women I ever met. Why? Why do you say that? You just—that's just a general <laughs> observation. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're pretty smart, and I think John was smart enough too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was her judgment, and um, I, I don't know. I, I was left, but that—that that was always my impression that nobody was smarter than my mother. However. I hope I could leave that impression with my children, but I don't. So I got the impression um, from your previous comments and uh, you know what you told me in 2005 that you look back on your childhood. This came out in your in answer to your uh, in your answer to Ben about his you know question about your mother as an influence in your life. But I get the impression that you felt your childhood in Ottawa in the 1930s was pretty idyllic. My childhood was very happy. Now, what most people say, well, how did, how did you manage going out without a father? This was wartime. All my friends' fathers were serving overseas. None mm -hmm. of them had fathers around. So I wasn't particularly special. And their fathers were alive and came home. Um, mine obviously didn't. But uh, my mother always had time for us. We were a threesome, John, my mother and myself. And every Sunday, we went on a picnic in the Gatineau. And um, she had breakfast with us every day, but uh, she worked late most nights or otherwise. Uh, Ottawa was still quite a social place. Lord Friesner was the governor general, and then he'd have these dinners at government house. And my mother was either invited by R.B. Bennett or Mackenzie King to go with her. And I used to love watching her get dressed at night. And uh, I, I have one little vignette for you. R.B. Bennett was an ardent suitor, and I wore this especially this brooch says T.T. Phyllis Turner and R.B. Bennett gave it to her. And I, my duty when I came home from school was to put the dozen red roses in the vase from R.B. Bennett, just a little vignette. Oh, so th that's very interesting because sometimes I get the impression when I'm reading about Bennett and King that they were looking for, you know, an appropriate um, accompaniment for some formal occasion or something when they went out with your mother but you're saying there was a in Bennett's case at least a bit of a romantic certainly not Mackenzie King, certainly not Mackenzie King but definitely, <laughs> <laughs> definitely R.B. Bennett but my mother had at that point she was much more interested in her job than getting married and she had no interest in getting married at that point she right. loved Bob and she loved the Ottawa life and <clears throat> And we we were brought up with civil servants, and I still believe Ottawa had the best civil service in the world at that point. We had Graham Towers, we had Norman Robertson, we had Mike Pearson, and so on. So the people that came to our house were never politicians; they were civil servants. Mm -hmm. right. And do you think your mother entertained more than the average uh, fellow public servant? And if so, well, why? No, my mother did not entertain when we were children. We, 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 she just never had time. Christmas dinner, yes, 
But when she became wife of the Lieutenant Governor in British Columbia, she entertained a lot. And we were in a period where, where there was a constant royal coming to stay. And my mother had the best cook in BC, and she we she entertained in a magnificent way. But growing up, no, she didn't have time. If, if she had time, it was for the children. She wasn't going to have dinner parties. So when she, these were her, uh, this was her social set, but she would um, socialize with them on public occasions or elsewhere, yes. or not yes. not at home. Interesting. Yes. Right. Okay. And and um, the question of um, John Turner's Catholicism came up a lot in the past. I was just wondering if I could ask you about that. Was there any consciousness of being, you know, well, I guess I, what I should ask is what what did it mean, if anything, to be Catholic in uh, Sandy well, Hill in the nineteen thirties and forties? We we went to mass every every day during Lent at seven thirty in the morning, and we went every Sunday, and it was a big part, I guess, of our lives. And John kept saying it was a choice of being a priest. <laughs> And so every girlfriend that got serious, he said, no, 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 I can't do that. I think I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but no, but I'm, I thought we were, we were, we were big Catholics. You mentioned earlier your um, father's absence. What did your mother tell you about your father? Very, very little. I think she adored him. He was very handsome and he was very charming, I guess, uh, but he was he had a thyroid problem and they it was malpractice basically they took out too much of his thyroid and she wanted him to come to canada to have the operation and he died really john was two and i was two months and my we had a brother in between who died shortly after being born because of malpractice at that hospital it had just opened so my mother was hit with these tragedies and how i i don't know how she managed no money and two children to bring up and uh, I, I she was brave apart from everything else she was so brave yeah i want to come back to that point but just a quick question i've always wondered i see pictures of your father and there's one in which he's wearing a top hat and it's maybe him it might not be it, the attribution is is um uncertain but there's another one of him um uh, Sitting in the, a, law, a chair on a lawn with his legs crossed. Are you yeah, familiar with that, that one? one? Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, do, I don't. Do I've think... never seen the top hat one, but that's okay. really extraordinary. My mother said, "You know, John was only two when when Daddy died, but he has all his mannerisms." Yeah, you can see you can see the um, in that uh, picture in the lawn chair. You can see the similarities. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. He never watched him, but he kind of walked the same way, except she found it really fascinating. I had not. Okay, just to go back to the, the main question I wanted to follow up on. And, you know, you've already talked about this a bit because you've talked about your mother's intelligence and uh, her looks and her style and that sort of thing. But, you know, she was unique in Ottawa at the time because no other woman got as high up in the public service as she did. No, so to, to what do you attribute that? Well, her ambition. Um, and, you know, when we were growing up, it's always do your best. Try your hardest. Uh, she never, uh, if I came home from school with a report card that didn't have all A's, she'd say, what's the B? I mean, she she her, she expected, she wasn't domineering. She, she just expected it of us. She knew we were smart and, and we both worked hard. And those were the days, of course, uh, when children did their own homework. Uh, doesn't exist now. And so she would be out in the evening and not say, I have to stay home to do uh, help with the homework. Nobody did that. Just the children did their own. And then the, ch the teacher knew how much the child had absorbed. It makes a lot more sense now than having the parents do the homework. Did you think that things changed? Can you remember things changing, changing significantly with her job when, when the war started? Uh, no, because she was working full out at the tariff board before. She was always okay. she was always working full out. I didn't notice any change, and I didn't for a while even know what she was doing. You you must have had um, domestic help then at home. We had this wonderful um, uh, Scottish girl, Isabel Kennedy, and she was she wasn't her, she was more of a housekeeper than a nanny, but mm -hmm. um, uh, she was always there. She'd be there until nineteen forty. Five, no, yes, 1945. She was with us about 15, 
She was okay. and she was she was wonderful. She was a good cook too. Yeah, so it was one person she'd keep house, she'd cook, she'd uh, mind the kids, and yep. uh, yeah, that must have been a godsend. Yeah, she lived in, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did uh, did she play a life in your uh, role in your life subsequently at all? Uh, no, no, we always kept in touch with her. When I went back to Ottawa, I'd always go and see her. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was a dear. We all we loved her. She was she was a wonderful a wonderful Scottish sense of humor and Scottish values. So um, no, I had a very happy childhood. I would say, yeah, I have absolutely no regrets of anything that happened in my childhood which is rather rare, I guess. So you have this um, mother who is a remarkably successful career woman. And in 1945, she just, you know, left, walked away. So she and... never, so my stepfather wanted to marry her in 1943. And she said, I'm not marrying you until the war is over, until, until I'm finished my job. And when mm -hmm. the war was over, then she married him and he had business interests in British Columbia and she had, she was from British Columbia so she had no problems about moving back and you know, she got involved in the university as you know she was chancellor of the university and then she worked her buns off too as chancellor because I can remember her coming home late for dinner after sort of many meetings mm -hmm. and then when he became lieutenant governor she worked full out governor house burned down and she had to refurnish the whole place and she had a string of royals and my, the, all the royals loved my mother and stepfather and they invited her back she became really good friends with many many of them and um when i thought well i, I won't name so what did, what did why frank ross do you have any ideas opposed to all of these other suitors well he was a wonderful man and he was very very generous and he had no children of his own, so John and I became his children, and uh, he, he he did everything possible in his life to help us. And uh, well, why the other? I don't know. You know, my mother at the same time was a very private person. I never, I never would have said, "Why did you marry him?" I, in those days, one didn't. Yeah. But anyway, and I was only thirteen. So what it's, remar that? it's remarkable, you know, she was only 40, 41 or something when in 1945. So she and she'd also been in the public service for barely 11 years, I think. Yeah, yeah. So right. She accomplished so much in such a short time. I know, I know, I know. But she was a phenomenon. As I say, she will always be the strongest influence in my life. And all of it is positive, which is also good. So I shouldn't say all of it. The last few years, she had Alzheimer's, and it was a bit of a nightmare. But mm -hmm. people lived through that, so I didn't think it was, that entered into the equation. Paul, Paul, do you mind if I interject with a question? Oh, please do. Yeah. So she accomplished so much, and and Mrs. Norris, you know, you you, you broke a lot of glass ceilings, and you know the frustrations that came with that, you know, the prevailing attitudes, you must have had times where you just had to hold your tongue and roll your eyes at some of the concepts of the times. Your mother went through this a generation earlier. She must have gone through so many frustrations and had to be patient with so many men who really didn't understand the way the future was going to unroll. Did she ever seem frustrated? Did she ever no, no, she joined the Zondra Club, I think it was called, it was the Feminist Women's Club in Ottawa, which is about the only thing I knew. But I subsequently uh, met many of the people that dealt with her in the war, and they said, oh, that I'd never met before. They said, oh, I always loved it when I had an appointment to go and see your mother. And so she, she, she wasn't a strident feminist by any means. Nor was I, really. I was delighted when they put me on boards and I made the cut on Montreal Trust three times and it subsequently sold. But um, I'm a firm believer, equal pay for equal work and so on. But neither of us were really strident feminists. You just worked hard, did your best, and if you contributed, you hoped that they'd give you a chance. Maybe you were, both were, but you just didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have one final question, something that's been um, I've been wondering about it doesn't have to do with your mother directly, but perhaps it goes back to this um, 
faith and education that was instilled in your mother by her mother. I'm, I'm interested in your education. Uh, I know what your brother's education was, but I'm, well, I I'm went not to entirely a, sure of yours. I went to a little convent in, on Bailey Avenue, uh, the Holy Cross convent. It was Holy could, you, convent. could you walk to school there? Yes, 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 walk to school. And all my children walked to school. Even my daughter had to walk up perpendicular up Clark Avenue. Anyway, I walked to school. And I was there until I finished um, grade eight. And then at that point, I was going into high school. I went to the Congress of the Sacred Heart in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. uh, I boarded there for the first year because we lived quite far away and it was sort of a hassle back and forth. Um, but I became head girl there and I loved it. Um, People don't love Congress, but I made a lot of friends there and I, I had a happy time. But when I came to the Gill, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I lived in the Royal Victoria College and uh, I made friends there for life. And as you know, I've been on the board of governors now for about almost 40 years and they gave me an honorary doctorate last year. And I have to tell you, well, that was the most thrilling day of my life because Miguel is kind of deep in my heart. And the one way I felt I could give back was working. I served on practically every committee known to man there. And working with academics, I was um, dealing with peers that were people that were brighter than I was, and we were dealing with ideas. And for me, that again, that was the second most important thing in my life was, apart from my children, was McGill. And I saw that video and enjoyed your speech very much. One, one final question. When you look back on setting out in the world as you got your education, what did you think your prospects were? I had absolutely as, as a woman, I'm mean, continuing on with the, the uh, feminist uh, line of questioning here. Did you feel I had, any, no, feel I had no idea. Absolutely not. I was I married and have four children and I adored my children. I had I did not I worked I, after McGill, I got a job on St. James Street. I was the first lady analyst on St. James Street. I worked for Green Shields and Company for the most wonderful Romanian. He had been the Romanian the finance minister and the head of uh, Green Shields got him over the farm in Saskatchewan, and he was my mentor. I worked there, but I, I didn't have any kind of, it was a good job, and I wrote the morning journal and so on. Uh, but once I got married, I thought that was, I was lying in bed reading the Gazette and thought, this is heaven. Uh, so, <laughs> but after uh, my children, when the youngest child was five, then I went back to work and uh, loved it. And I, I love Montreal, and I lived actually my life in French for about during the day for about thirty years because I was, it was a rent, renting warehouse space in Griffintown before Griffintown got smart. So anyway, but no, I did not grow up with any ambition to be a world leader. It just things kind of one thing kind of led to another, and uh, the other thing I think the other. Perhaps the most important thing in life is that I've been extremely lucky. I've been at the right place at the right time so many times. And luck can play a huge role in your life. I, I have an additional question. Um, I have siblings. I have kids who are siblings. I have grandkids who are siblings. And I know that siblings don't always get along. You were very close in age to John. Did you guys, did you two ne sometimes not get along as, as, as like, possible? We thought, we thought like mad. I remember going <laughs> on Friday on Sunday, going to picnic, and we were arguing on the back seat on whose side of the car the dog would sit. We <laughs> argued, and my mother would slam on the brake. If you two don't stop arguing, I'm turning around and going back. Oh, yeah, we fought all the time. Oh, yeah, it was fun, though. And I think what Paul started with this evening was was asking you, is there something about your mother that, that hasn't been told that you would like everybody else to know about? I, I, I don't know what to say about that. I think her many accomplishments have been noted, the tariff board, oil and fats administration, uh, the government house transfer of UBC. Um, but, but, but her children, John and I, were always foremost <laughs> in her life. And uh, we were never, ever neglected. And uh, we, we were always very close. And uh, I would talk to her after I was married. Uh, and she came each time I had a baby and helped me through that. And she, um, I, 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 can't, I can't 
think of anything really that has been neglected, except people perhaps don't realize how really beautiful she was and how, how much charm she had. And men really loved my mother. She, um, they, you could see it. They, even the ones she worked with and socially because she was funny and charming. And I think that part maybe has been underplayed, but apart from that. Did you have any further questions, Paul? No, that that's great. I'm really, uh, really pleased to have um, Mrs. Norris's thoughts and to have them recorded for posterity. And, uh, you know, as I said before, I hope this contributes to greater interest in, in your mother. Paul, can I ask you a question? What sure. Did, what did you interview me on in 2005? Was I working in a political campaign? No, we just talked generally about uh, your brother because I was doing, I was working on research for the biography I wrote of him, about him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you so much, Mrs. Thank, Norris. Thank you both very much. And as I said, uh, you're going to send me, Ben, all the links. Absolutely. I, I can't tell you what an honor and a joy it has been for us to have you join I, us tonight. You all, you both have been wonderful. I enjoyed it. And anything I can do to promote the image of my mother is good news for me. You've helped us promote the image of your mother, to preserve your mother's memory. What an amazing woman she was, and what an amazing woman you are. Thank you so much. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Lovely to speak with you again. Love Good night. Bye-bye. Did you, uh, I think we kind of flipped things around, Paul. We had the Q&A before the video. Did you have any final comments tonight? Uh, no, not really. I think, uh, you know, I've got things to reflect on, um, having seen the whole package tonight. and. Um, just thinking back to, uh, you know, having lived off and on with this topic for a decade and a half, um, it's uh, still, as I said before, a subject crying out for more investigation. Well, I, I am absolutely thrilled that we've been able to uh, share uh, Phyllis Turner's story with more people tonight. Uh, and through the pamphlet, I, I can't tell you how much I, we appreciate the fact that you've joined us tonight. And, and thank you so much to you and, and Christine Jackson for putting together the amazing pamphlet. Uh, very appreciative of Mrs. Norris for, 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 for eagerly consenting to be part of tonight's presentation and certainly to thank her uh, husband John, who was her technical support with Zoom. She'd never been on Zoom before. And of course, our own technical support, Jacob, thank him as well for uh, making all of this possible. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, Paul's book. It's a wonderful book. This is what got this all started tonight. The pamphlet is online. Take a look at that. There's all sorts of great information and background in there. And I thank everybody for joining us tonight and uh, hope to see you on November the fourth for our next uh, speaker series presentation, which will be in person at the auditorium, hearing all about the uh, mid-century history of Lower Town and the effects of urban renewal. Thank you very much, everybody.